everyone, and good evening. Welcome to tonight's webinar with a, a very, very special guest. So for all the new people who join us today, and uh, we welcome you, I'd like to give you a very brief uh, description about what is CoReach and who we are. Uh, first of all, my name is Rimil Jizawi. I am um, I'm the founder of CoReach and one of the uh, great CoReachers. And uh, CoReach basically, in short, is the first coaching firm and a platform in Saudi Arabia. We are a group of passionate advocate uh, people for bringing the human elements back to workplaces. We thrive by enabling the we in culture in organizations through providing a different approach to our thinking, communicating, working, and living. We do that through a firm where we serve businesses for this cause, and we do it through a platform where we open it for all the individual people so they come and thrive with us. We are, a teal, we are an agile teal organization that works under the uh, holacracy system, and that makes us the first company to implement holacracy management system in Saudi Arabia. Every year during the holy month of Ramadan, we give back to our community by offering daily talks, workshops that embraces, <clears throat> embraces different values. We call it Zakat Ilm, or which means the uh, charity of knowledge. We decided that our theme for this year is humanity, because with all that is happening in the world and something about this pandemic brought us back to our roots of humanity and brought us together. Tonight, with all excitement in the world that I have, I am super excited. Tonight we have, um, a speaker that I consider my teacher, my mentor, um, a person that I learn and I continuously learn from. Dr. Marshall Goldsmith is the only two-time thinkers, 50 number one leadership uh, thinker in the world. He, uh, he was recognized as the number one executive coach for eight consecutive years. Marshall is the number one New York Times bestselling author of Triggers and What Got You Here Won't Get You There both of which are listed in Amazon's top 100 leadership and success books of all times. Dr. Marshall Goldsmith, we welcome you uh, with very warm heart and uh, with a lot of gratitude. We're honored that you are with us here tonight. Um, Thank you so much for inviting me. Good to see you again. The last time I saw you was in London. Yes, yes. I had the, the honor to see you in London, and it was such a great time there. And uh, tonight we're going to enjoy one hour and a half with you, which Good. we're looking forward to that. If anyone has any question, please keep asking your questions in the Q&A, and we will be regularly reading your ch the chat for any comments that you're having. And um, we're going to just enjoy our wonderful time tonight. Very good. First is thanks to all the nice people that wrote in greetings and comments. It's wonderful to be here. I've been to your fine country many times before, so I'm very, very happy to be here on this call. Thank you. There are a lot of messages. Uh, people are excited. I'm so happy. The, so happy to be here. Ahmed Yanis, good to see you. Yes. Very good. Hey, we also have someone here from Greece on the call. Very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> oh, very good. I think we, ha we will have from uh, around the world today. Yeah, somebody from Pennsylvania. Very nice. Very nice. We have people from all around. Very fascinating. Yeah. Okay, let's get started. What is, what is your first good question for me? Okay. So... Um, I think until people will start sending their questions. Okay. Um, let, me, let me begin by talking about the crisis. Why don't we do that? Because that's right. on everyone's mind. I'm going to okay. start out by talking about the crisis that we have now. I'm going to talk about some ideas 
not so much just for leaders or coaches, but for individuals. Then I'm going to talk about idea for leaders during this time of crisis, because many of the coaches coach people who are leaders. So I have a, a good ideas for someone to coach leaders. So we're going to again, though, we're just looking at you as a human being. Learning point number one from today's crisis is never, never get attached to the end results of what you do. Never confuse your identity with the end results of what you do. That's almost always a mistake. We do not have total control in life of the outcomes of anything that we do. And realize that and never become too attached to the end results. Because when we do, we always set ourselves up for failure. Uh, in the United States, they have the National Football League. And what happens is people, after they retire, within five years, many are bankrupt, depressed, often anxious, even suicidal. Why? Well, they get so attached to this result or this ad admiration that that becomes their life. And it gets very, very difficult when it's not always there. So the first thing is, number one, don't get attached to the outcomes of what you do because you do not have total control over those outcomes. Now, let me give you an example as a golfer. I'm not a golfer, yet my friend Mark Ryder, who does the books with me, plays golf. And as a simple example, as a golfer, you have a guy in front of you. He's loud, he's making noise, uh, he's bothersome. You're getting ready to hit your shot for the, you're in this club title. Hit your shot, zoom, 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 down the fairway it goes. Some idiot has left a can in the middle of the fairway. Your lovely golf shot pew, hits the can and goes scurrying off into the rough. Ooh, you're very angry. This isn't right, it's not fair, the can shouldn't have been there. You march over to the ball. What is the first thing you have to learn to be a great golfer? Let go. You've got to let go of the past. You can't think about the other person. You can't think about the can. You can't think about your bad luck. You breathe and you let go. Then you have a strategy. Your strategy could be to take a risk, try to put the ball on the green and win the tournament. Your strategy could be I'm ahead anyway, just hit it onto the fairway and, and then you'll do fine. You have to have a strategy though. What is your plan? Then you have a strategy. You breathe, you don't think about the past. You let go of the past. You don't think about winning the tournament. You don't think about the future. You focus on one thing. You hit the shot that is in front of you. you focus on one thing, you hit the shot that's in front of you. During this period of crisis, very important for individuals. First, breathe. We have to let go of the past. You did not cause this crisis. It's not your fault. Forgive yourself. I'm sure many of us think, well, I should have saved more money. I should have done this. I should have done that. I could have done something else. Some government leader could have done this or that. There's a million could have done's that we can focus on. None of those help. Breathe. Let go of the past. Hit the shot in front of you, just like the golfer. Hit the shot in front of you. And there's something called pragmatic optimism. You have to be a realist as a coach or a leader. And I'm gonna be realistic with you. It's not good out there. And there's a high chance it's not gonna be real good for quite a while. It's very possible we could be going into a global depression or a global recession. This is the reality that exists. Hiding from that reality does not help. Happy thinking will not make this reality go away. We have to be a pragmatist and an optimist at the same time. Face the hard reality that's out there. Then say, given this, this is where my shot has landed right now. For whatever reason, maybe it wasn't my fault, it doesn't matter, it is what it is. Make peace with that and say, how can I do the best I can possibly do now? Now, here's a very important comment. 
A very important comment. One of my great uh, coaches, I have this group called the 100 Coaches. And I was in this program called Design the Life You Love. And the woman said, who are your heroes? My heroes were very kind and generous people who are great teachers. The great Peter Drucker, Francis Hesselbein, Alan Mulally, wonderful people. And they gave me so much and never charged me any money. Well, the woman who did the program said, you should be more like these great people. I decided that was very good. I decided that I would adopt 15 people, teach them all I know for free. And the only price is when you get old, you do the same thing. I made a little video and said on LinkedIn, I said, my name is Marshall. I got ranked number one coach and thinker and book and I'm getting old. I'm going to donate all that I know to 15 people. And the only price is when they get old, they have to do the same thing. I thought maybe a hundred people would apply and I would adopt 15. So far over 18,000 people have applied and I've adopted about 250. And it says, you've met these people, I mean, wonderful people, amazing people. And it's just been a really, really nice project. So, and for even these people who are very successful people, for many of them, it's hard right now. It's very, very hard. So the first thing is let go of the past, let go of the past hit the ball in front of you. One of the great people I've adopted, his name is Harry Kramer. Harry was the CEO of a company called Baxter, a huge drug company. And, you know, he retired and he's been very, very successful. And someone asked him a question. They said, as the CEO of this big company, you've had to make many hard decisions. You've had to fire people. You've had to lay people off. You've had to do things that really were painful for people. How could you sleep at night knowing you had to do such things? He had a very profound answer. He said, before you do anything, ask yourself two questions. Question one, am I doing what I think is right? Am I doing what I think is right? None of us always know what is right. All you can do is your best. Am I doing what I think is right? And number two, am I doing my best? Am I doing my best? And if the answer is yes, I'm doing what I think is right. And yes, I'm doing my best. Do you know what he said? Make peace and go to sleep at night. Make peace and go to sleep at night. All you can do is do your best. And all you can do is what you think is right. So that's my one advice for your coaches. Make peace with what is. Be a, be a realist, pragmatism. And at the same time, how can I make the best of this? How can I make the best of this? Now, two, advice for leaders. During periods of rapid transition and change, like now, people need more structure, not less structure. Now, Reem, I'm going to talk tonight about various structures we can use to have a great life. People need more structure. They do not need less structure during periods of rapid change. More communication not less. During periods of rapid change, here are six questions that I believe every leader should have a dialogue with every one of their co-workers and discuss. Now, Reem, I'm going to share the six questions. I'll also send you an email afterwards with an article. That way, people do not have to write down notes about everything I say. So it is published. So I'll send it to you and you can send it to everyone. And as you know, I give all my material away. So if you go to my website, www.mynamemarshallgoldsmith.com, I give everything away. All my material you may copy and share and download and duplicate. And please use my material in any way you wish. You can give it to people. And if you want to change it around a little bit, it's okay. It's okay. I don't care. You can change it any way you want to. Please just use it any way that you wish. If it helps anyone, it would be good for me. So, and by the way, Reem, I have a foolproof system to avoid theft. I have the world's best security system. Do you know what it is? Give everything away. <laughs> if you give everything away, no one can steal anything. So it's a very, very, very nice system. Very, very nice system. Now, what would I suggest is the six questions. First, the leader sits down with the person and says, you know, 
where are we going? That is called question number one. Where are we going? And the person should say, here's where I see us going as a larger organization. Then ask a question, where do you think we should be going? So you want to have a dialogue, what you think and what the other person thinks. Number two, where are you going? I would say, here's where I see you and your part of the business going. Then ask that person a question. Where do you think you and your part of the business should be going? Because you want connection two ways. One, you with the person, and two, the big picture and the small picture. Question number three, doing well. I would say, here's what I see you and your part of the business doing very well. And then ask the person a question. What are you proud of? What are you proud of about yourself? What do you think you're doing well? You see, that is a very good question for a leader to ask. If you ask the question, what are you doing well? The person may say things you never thought of, such as, my team worked very hard to help you prepare for the presentation all weekend. I'm so happy it worked well. Well, you might say, I didn't know that. Thank you so much. I should recognize the team. Number four, suggestions for the future. And I'm a, a great believer in something called feed forward, which is more focused on the future than the past. Feed forward. And I would say to the person, um, look into the future. I would say, here are ideas or suggestions I might have for you. Then ask the person a very good coaching question. If you were the coach for you, what ideas and suggestions might you have for yourself? If you were the coach for you, what ideas and suggestions might you have for yourself? That's a very good question. Now, I actually can mention the names of my clients. I've done this with seven major CEOs. One of the CEOs was George Borst, B-O-R-S-T. George was CEO of Fo Toyota Financial Services, a multi-hundred billion dollar organization. George was a little skeptical about question four, the question about if you were the coach for you, what ideas would you have for you? Until he tried it. Then he said he was very surprised. He said more than half of the time, people's suggestions for themselves were better than my suggestions. And I ended up saying, let's do it your way. I like it better. So that was question four. Question five, how can I help? As a leader, how can I help you to achieve these goals? And then finally, question six, what suggestions or ideas might you have for me? How can I do things better? Six basic questions. Question number one, where are we going? Dialogue. Question two, where are you going? Dialogue. What's going well? Dialogue. Ideas for the future? Dialogue. How can I help? What suggestions do you have for me? Then finally, the key to making this all work is something called mutual responsibility. What does mutual responsibility mean? I would say to the direct report, Mr. or Ms. Direct Report, you know, about every so often, we're going to have this dialogue about the six basic questions. If at any time you have doubt or confusion, ambiguity, you feel overcommitted, you don't know what the goals are, I want you to take the responsibility to talk with me. If I do my job and establish these clear parameters and you do your job, if there's ever confusion, there is no reason we're not going to have clarity about goals and alignment. Now, here's a very important final point during periods of rapid change like today. Back to pragmatic optimism. You have to be honest with the people and say the following. I've got to be very clear. Our priorities may change. We may set our goals for today, and these goals may not be the same goals we have next year or perhaps even next week. We're going through a period of unprecedented rapid change. I want you to take responsibility along with me. I'm going to check in with you on a regular basis so when things change, I let you know as soon as possible. And I want you to take responsibility if you feel confusion, anxiety, if you feel overcommitted, check in with me as soon as possible. As long as both of us take total responsibility for this communication, there is no reason we shouldn't have clarity. Here's the other reality. You can do everything I just described and still lose. As I said, you can't get fixated on the end results. 
One of my good friends is a very famous man in the restaurant business. He owns several of the world's most famous restaurants. His assessment is they're all going to go bankrupt. They're all going to go bankrupt. Why? Well, some of them are in tourist destinations. There's going to be no tourism for the next year. And these are very fancy, very expensive restaurants. He can't serve carry out food. The reality is in life, sometimes you lose. You can have all the happy thinking in the world. Sometimes you win and sometimes you lose. You can't get fixated on the outcomes. You can't blame yourself or other people. Sometimes the environment changes. All you can do is my friend Harry said is you breathe. Did I do what I think was the right thing at the time? Did I do my best? If the answer is yes and yes, you make peace, you make peace. Now, before we get into more of a dialogue, and Reem, I'm gonna see if we have questions for me. If anybody does have questions, please ask. As soon as we get into more of a dialogue again, very important for coaches. As I've grown older, my level of aspiration in life has actually gone down and down and down. My level of impact has gone up and up and up. Why? I quit worrying about what I'm not gonna change. I quit worrying about what I am not going to change. I just focus on what I can change. Peter Drucker was the greatest management thinker in history. I got ranked number one leadership thinker in the world. My intellect compared to Peter Drucker was that of a 10 year old. I was on his advisory board for very blessed for 10 years. I got to spend many days with him. He taught me many wonderful lessons. One of the great lessons is this. Our mission in life is to make a positive difference, not to prove that we're smart and not to prove we're right. Our mission in life is to make a positive difference, not to prove that we are smart and not to prove that we are right. In your life, you've probably taken test after test after test after test, thousands of tests with one goal, prove you were smart over and over and over again. It's very difficult to stop doing this. And as we move into leadership, we have to quit trying to prove how smart we are all the time and how right we are and let other people be smart and let other people be winners. This is easy to understand. It's very hard to do. So learning point number one, our mission in life is to make a positive difference, not to prove that we're smart and not to prove that we're right. Learning point number two, every decision in the world is made by the person who has the power to make the decision. Make peace with that. Every decision in the world is made by the person who has the power to make the decision make peace with that. Not the smartest person or a good person or a fair person or the right person. Decisions, as Peter Drucker taught me, are made on one variable power. Whoever has the power to make the decision is going to make the decision. If I need to influence you and you have the power to make the decision, there's one word to describe you. That word is called customer. There's one word to describe me. That word is called salesperson. You do not have to buy. I have to sell. As a leader, you sell what you can sell. You change what you can change. If you can sell it, you sell it. If you can change it, you change it. If you cannot sell it and you cannot change it, let go, let go, let go, let go. Now, before we have questions, just a, a guideline. One of the things I always teach is something called feed forward. Feed forward is a wonderful process that's kind of the highlight of my coaching. And Reem, I'll send everyone an article called Feed Forward describing this process so you don't have to take notes. In Feed Forward, for example, if I teach a class, I would say, and by the way, I just did this in, in St. Petersburg, Russia in November with 50,000 people in one room in a giant stadium, feed forward. Well, I would I get up and say, look, we're going to practice something called feed forward. In this exercise, you have two.
is called. Yeah, they're like, yes, can they're nice people in the room? Would you like to help these nice people? People say yes. So you're either learning or helping, which is very good. So your mission is learn as much as you can, help as much as you can. Well, then I have everyone pick something to improve. For example, they'll say, I want to be a better listener, and they ask a person for ideas. Say, my name is John, I want to listen better, please give me ideas. Whatever the person says, you say thank you. You don't judge the ideas, you don't put people down, you say thank you. You don't promise to do everything. Leadership is not a popularity contest. You promise to listen and do what you can. Then the other person says, my name is Mary, I want to get recognition, give me ideas. They share the ideas, then they go and do it again and again and again and again and again. And at the end of the exercise, I ask, give me one word to describe this exercise. The answer is positive, simple, useful, helpful, or even fun. What's the last word to describe any feedback activity? Fun. I say, why is it fun? Well, it's focused on the future you can change, not the past you can't change. It's, it's about creating a great world in the future, not reliving a humiliating past. And, and you, you don't have to do things. You learn to do what you can do. You learn to do what you can do, and you learn to let go or let go of what you cannot do. So you focus on do what you can and let go of what you can't do. Feed forward. Well, now, Kareem, this exercise tonight, I'd like it to be feed forward. People are going to ask me for ideas. First, I cannot answer ideas where I'm not an expert. If I'm not an expert, I'm just going to say I'm not an expert. I don't want questions about the global economy. I don't want questions about Donald Trump. I don't want questions about the medical situation. I'm not an expert on these topics. I'm an expert at helping successful people achieve positive change in their behavior. Any question about that is just fine. So you're asking me these good questions. And I give you, if I have an idea, I'll give you my ideas. Now, if I give you a good idea, I want you to say, thank you, thank you. If I give you a stupid idea, I want you to say, Thank you, thank you. You see, you don't have to do it anyway. I'll never know the difference. <laughs> I'll never know the difference. <laughs> so, and by the way, if I give you an idea, it may not help you, yet it may help another person. So one thing is only do what you're taught if it works in the context of your life. I'm not an expert on you. Some ideas may help some and not others, that's okay. It doesn't mean they're good or bad ideas. It just means they don't help everyone. So enough of me talking. Reem, why don't we take one good question for me at a time? All right. There are plenty of questions. So um, maybe the first question that we can uh, start off with is how can we find our purpose? As leaders, as people, how can we find our purpose? Okay, very good. How can we find our purpose? It's a very deep question. It's going to focus on the issue of what really matters in life. What is important in life? And, you know, I've done eight programs at my home with retiring CEOs or retired CEOs and ask a question, what's, what do you want to do now? And some of them, for the first time, have had to wrestle with what really matters in life. What's important? What is my purpose? Well, first, take care of your health. And if you don't do that, especially in today's time, none of the other stuff matters. Wealth, you need enough to have at least a middle-class life. And if you do that, that's probably going to be fine. Have great relationships with people you love. Never get so busy achieving your corporate goals, you forget the people you love. Now, back to your good question. Let's assume that you take care of your health. You have enough money to have at least a mid-level life and you have great relationships with people you love. What matters in your purpose? Two things, happiness and meaning. And you need both. I'm going to give you definitions. My definitions are not intended to be, quote, the definition or the ideal definition. My old mentor, Paul Hersey, taught me, always use something called operational definitions. So when I define a word, all that means is that's just the way I'm defining the word. I'm not saying it's the right definition or a good one. It's just for this conversation, so you know what I mean. 
So when I use the word happiness, what I mean is joy in the process of what you're doing. You actually like the process of doing it itself. And then the second term is the term meaning. The results of what I'm doing matter to me. They're important to me. Happiness and meaning. And we've done research, my daughter Kelly and I have done research involving thousands of people from around the world. And what have we learned? You need both. If you experience neither happiness nor meaning, well, you've got a, not a good life at all. If you experience meaning without happiness, well, you're making a contribution, but you're a martyr or victim. You have a very joyless life. If you try to experience happiness and no meaning, well, you can have, amuse yourself, but you have kind of an empty life. You need to have both happiness and meaning at the same time. What does that mean? I really love what I'm doing. And at the same time, I think it's important and meaningful to me. Now, here's a very important point. No one can define happiness for you. And no one can define meaning for you, but you. You need to ask yourself, what can I do in life that I love that makes me happy? What can I do in life that is meaningful for me? And to the degree you can do that while maintaining your health, having at least enough money to have a medium income, and having great relationships with the people you love, you just won in the game of life. You just won the game of life. So that would be my answer to, again, a very good question. Now, I'm going to talk about my own life in terms of purpose. As I said, as I've grown older, my level of aspiration has gone down, but my impact has gone up. Let me give you my purpose for this uh, lovely webinar tonight. I have one purpose for you as a listener. My goal is to help you have a little better life. That's enough. To help you have a little better life. And then, if possible, maybe help you have a, help other people have a little better lives. And as a coach, don't be too hard on yourself. You're not going to change the whole world. Every one of your clients is not going to get better. Sometimes you're going to fail. It's okay. It's okay. Look, did I do my best? Did I do what I think was right? And, and sometimes did I help people have a better life? If the answer to that is, yeah, I, I did what I thought was right and I did my best. And, you know, some people had a better life. You know what? God bless you. That's enough. That's enough. Okay, next question. Um, okay, thank you so much. This is um, the question. It might be deep, but your answer is profound. Thank you so much. It's uh, a lot of learning to all of us. I have a question here that says, what is the biggest lesson you learned from COVID-19? Don't get attached to the results of what you do. If you do, you're always going to face disappointment. And you know, the great Western disease is, I will be happy when. When I get the money, the status, the BMW, when I get the condominium, when I have that achievement, I will be happy when. Well, we all have the same win. We all have the same win. Don't get fixated on the results of things, because if you do, you're always chasing something else to find happiness. You need to find happiness from within, not from the outside. You don't control the outside. And what I've learned from this COVID-19 is there are a lot of things in life we do not control. Realistically speaking, I'm, I'm 71. I could die. Well, it's not because I'm a good person or a bad person. I don't have total control over everything out here. None of us do. And find peace, find happiness where you are. Tomorrow is not a, gu a guarantee. Next question. 
Thank you. Um, I have Sarah asking, how would you deal with a leader who might be very unclear of how to move forward? Mm, this is a very good point. A good question is, how do I influence people sometimes? Let's assume I don't have authority. Let's say, Reem, you're my manager and you're not so clear. Yet, what do I do now? Because how do I know where to go when I'm getting no guidance? Well, the first thing is you maybe aren't the leader, but you try to help that person and you figure out how can I best help Reem? How can I best help her rather than waiting for her to find answers out of her sky? You know, how can I best help her? What will she listen to? And again, the decision is made by the decision maker. If she's the leader, she may ultimately have the power to make the decision anyway. How can I influence her in a way that I think is most positive? So I treat you like a customer. I sell what I can sell. I show respect to you. And I do my best to influence you. And I also realize I don't have total power over the decision. I do my best. Now, that's about all you can do when you try to influence someone where you do not have direct or line authority. You do your best. And by the way, you make peace with what you can't change. Um, if anyone in the room is an engineer, any engineers identify yourself there? Any engineers in the chat room? Let's see if we have some engineers. Uh, we use engineers. I don't see any yet. Yes. Oh, engineer. yeah. What's that? Oh, we have engineers. Oh, come. several. Several engineers. Now, now my, my fine engineers, my engineers, you can answer this in the chat box. Have you ever gone through life looking for logic and been constantly surprised because you don't find it? Uh, you know, you're looking for things to be logical and you're, yes, uh, yes, yes, this happens to my good engineers. Yes, 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 I've done that. Now, my fine engineers, I, I, all the time one of them says yes, yes. Now, I have another question, my good engineer. Um, have you ever told your friends and family members before that, that their comments were illogical? Uh, have you done that before? Maybe a wife or a husband or partner or family member. Have you told them their comments are illogical? Have you done that before? Oh, look at this. Yes, yes. We're, we're, we're getting uh, yeses. <laughs> daily, yeah, yeah, ha, yes, yeah, lots of yeses here. Now, I have another question. Do they love you because you do this or in spite of the fact that you do this? Do they love you because you do this or do they love you in spite of the fact that you do this? One person says, in spite of, I just did this yesterday. <laughs> well, you see, my good engineers, <laughs> my good engineers, uh, I have a degree in math. And it's a classic, I went to engineering school, it's a classic problem, looking for logic. It's very hard for engineers to face the fact decisions aren't made based on logic or rationality. Decisions are made based on the power to make the decision. Now, Reem, Reem, have you ever had this thought before? I, Reem, am amazed that someone at that level, talking about very high level people, is crazy or weird or acts like an idiot or can be so stupid. I'm amazed that a person at that level can be so dumb. Have you ever had these thoughts before in your life? Oh yeah. Reem has yes. had these thoughts. Reem has had such thoughts. Now Reem, I'm gonna point out to you, these thoughts make no sense. Are you ready? Seemingly intelligent Reem has had these thoughts. These, make, these thoughts make no sense. Reem, before today, have you ever read a history book? Have you done that? Yes or no, history book? Yes. She's read history books. In the history of this world, Reem, have most people those high levels of money and status and power? Have they been mostly women or men over the years? Who have most of them been? Men, sir. And of course, she's right again, mostly men. Uh, have they been mostly younger or perhaps just a little older? Um, older, a little bit, yes. Now, Reem, in all those history books you've read, is there anything in the entire history of the world that would lead you to believe when you take old men who give them huge amounts of money and status and power, they begin to act incredibly sane and rational? 
did you read such a history book as that? No. <laughs> no, not, not that I recall of, no. <laughs> They often just get crazier and crazier and crazier. Well, you see, <laughs> decisions are not made based on rationality or logic or sanity, not on this planet. Decisions are made by decision makers. Decisions are made by decision makers. Make peace with that. Now, let, I've already talked about how to understand this. If you're my boss, I need to influence you. Now, let's take the opposite. This is from Peter Drucker. Let's imagine I'm your manager. And I am the decision maker and you influence me. Well, here's my advice. If her idea is even close to what I would do anyway, do it her way. Why? She'll be more committed. If her idea is even close to what I wanted to do, don't argue, just do it her way. Don't add too much value. On the other hand, sometimes as a leader, you just disagree. So in this case, Reem, you want to do Y and I want to do X and I respect you. I just disagree. How would I deal with this disagreement as your manager? I might say, you know, Reem, I respect you. You're a brilliant woman. Um, you know, we've talked about things in the past and I've changed my mind. In this case, Reem, you want to do X and I've really thought a lot about it. I want you to do Y for the following reasons. Reem says, you know, uh, Marshall, I understand. I disagree. I think we should do X. I can say, Reem, in this case, you've explained your point very well. You're a very smart woman. I understand. This is a decision I'm paid to make. I want you to do why. Reem says, I think you are wrong. You know what I can say, Reem? In this case, or in any case, I may be wrong. I'm not pretending to be perfect here. This is just my best judgment. And by the way, Reem, I want to assure you of one thing. If I'm not wrong this time, I will certainly be wrong sometime. This is the thing that I think is the best for us to do. And I've given you the reasons why, and I would like you to support me as best you can. Don't, don't prove she's wrong or you're smarter than her or all that nonsense. If you're the leader, you don't have to do that. You get to make the decision. You get to make the decision. Look at the people I coach. These are CEOs of multi-billion dollar companies. They don't need to prove anyone else is wrong. They don't need to prove they're right. They get to win anyway. It's better to respect people and when possible, let them win. And if not possible in your mind, then it's okay, just disagree. You don't have to prove they're wrong or put them down wrong. Does that make sense to you? Perfect sense. Actually, um, I really wish that leaders would, we would really think in that way and behave in that way where this, the last phrase, it makes all the difference. Um, mm -hmm. I might be wrong. It's, it, this is the decision. I might be wrong. I'm not assuming that I'm, I'm not uh, saying that I will be right, but I might be wrong. And that's, that brings us to our core humanity, actually. I'm, I, I'm a leader, but I'm a human as well. I do mistakes. Of course. I love that. Now, Reem, one of the great leaders who ever coached is a man named Alan Mulally. Alan was the CEO of the Ford Motor Company. When the stock was $1, he left, it was $18.40. While he was there, the stock went up 1,837%, and even more impressive, he was the CEO of a company that was a union company, the United Auto Workers. They don't usually like CEOs. They usually hate the CEO. When he left the Ford Motor Company, he had an approval rating from every employee in a union company of 97%. The employees love this guy. Now, Alan is, I was his coach. He's one of my great friends now. We're working on projects together. So, you know, he's an amazing guy. Alan Ream, back to your point, he becomes the CEO of Ford. The company is losing $17 billion. His first meeting with the top 16 leaders, he says, pick your top five priorities. Then next week, we're gonna go over all five, red, yellow, green. Green means on the plan. Yellow, not on the plan, but I have a strategy. And red, I'm not on the plan and I have no strategy. I'm lost. Red, yellow, green. So the first meeting, 16 leaders, five priorities, all green, all green. Everyone says they're on the plan and the company is losing 17 billion with a B, billion dollars. So Alan goes, well, wait, we're all on plan yet we're losing 17 billion dollars. I guess the plan must be to lose at least 17 billion dollars because that's what we're doing here. 
why don't we try again? Finally, one person said, Red, I'm not on the plan and I don't know how to get there. What did my friend Alan say? Thank you. Thank you for having the courage to say Red. Then he said something very profound. He said, you're not on plan and you do not know how to get there. I want to assure you of one thing. My name is Alan Mullally. I'm the CEO of the Ford Motor Company and I know much less than you do. I know much less than you do. Why don't we find some smart young engineers out there who know what they're doing and try to solve the problem. Within 10 minutes, the problem was solved. Why? He had the humility to say, I don't know the answer. By the way, in that problem they were discussing, the top 16 people in that room, none of them knew the answer. None of them knew the answers. They had these young smart people that could figure it out. Well, fine. You see, in the past, the leader felt they had to know more than the people being led. Today, another lesson from Peter Drucker is people manage knowledge workers. You want your people to know more than you, not less than you. If you're a CEO today and you know more about marketing than the marketing person, more about finance than the finance person, more about HR than the HR person, you do not have a leadership problem. You have a selection problem. You have the wrong team. You want them to know more than you. So you don't have to sit there and pretend as a leader, you know more than they know. Anyway, very good. Yes, thank you. So moving to our next question. Um, what question I may, uh, this is Yasmin saying, what question I may ask myself in the time of stress, uncertainty, and not being able to take a decision? Mm. I would suggest first, give yourself a limited amount of time. Then when there's no more data than you could collect, you make a choice and move forward. When there is no more data that you can collect, you give yourself a limited amount of time and then you make a decision. Because once there's no more information, you make a decision. Now, the person that asked that question probably has an issue with perfectionism. The need to be right all the time. Realize that we all fail and we all make bad decisions. It's part of life. No decision though is often a worse decision. And the alternative could be no decision. Well, gather the information, you make a decision, you do what you think is right, you do your best. Like the golfer, you hit the shot, you have a strategy, you hit the shot. You don't always hit a good shot. Sometimes you hit a bad shot. Okay, breathe. <sighs> Let go. New shot, new life. A good way to look at this, every time I take a deep breath, it's a new me. So everyone take a deep breath. <sighs> I want you to think, new me, new me. Me. Whatever happened before happened, don't make yourself feel bad. Don't try to make yourself feel guilty. Do your best. Make the decision. If it works, it works. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. All you did was you did your best. Make peace. Move on. If not, you get paralyzed. You get paralyzed. And by the way, sometimes in life, there's a great parable in India called the Gita that talks about this. Sometimes in life, you have two choices. Choice A is not good. Choice B is worse. Choice A, not good. Choice B, even worse. You gotta pick the choice that's the least bad and make the best of that. Sometimes that's the way it is. And in life, your leaders need to know this and your coaches need to know this. Sometimes you lose. You don't always win. Sometimes you lose. There's a book called The Secret. I don't know if you ever read this book, but it sold 7 million copies and it's based on a terrible premise. If I envision it, it will happen. So what they did is they study like this movie star envisioned being a movie star and she is. 
And then this guy thought he would envision his cancer goal, and it did. And the sports person thought they'd be the champion, and they are. The stories are all true. I have a degree in math. There's one thing they forgot about. They didn't interview the dead people who envisioned the cancer would go away. They didn't interview the thousand waitresses in Hollywood who all envisioned being movie stars. They didn't interview the thousand basketball teams that lost. They only interviewed the one and one. Well, it's called the survivor bias in mathematics. Sometimes you don't envision things away. You have to face reality. About four out of five small businesses within 10 years goes bankrupt anyway. That's reality. Well, you don't always win. In fact, many of the most successful people in the world have lost several times. Many people, the most successful people in the world have gone through periods of life where they've lost. One of the best things that ever happened to me in my life as I was cut or rejected from the high school football team as a boy. It was one of the best things that ever happened to me. I mean, at the time, I was crying. I was so sad. In hindsight, I wasn't going to be a football player. Can you imagine me playing American football? No. And I wasn't a great athlete. Well, the fact that I was rejected really inspired me to think, well, maybe I should work on studying, being smart. Why, that other thing is not going to work anyway. Well, you know, failure is part of life. You do your best. I tried and I failed. It's okay. It's one of the best things that ever happened to me. And many of us, if you talk about people's life and you say, okay, what are some of the most valuable things that ever happened is your failures. Now, I'm often asked a question. If I had the opportunity to go back in my life and change things, what would I change? And the answer is nothing. And that's not because I'm arrogant or I think I did great things. I started out very poor, very low income, very difficult environment. I ended up being very successful. If I did not have the failures, I would not have the learning that came from the failures. If I did not have the failure, I could not have the learning that came from the failure. We learn through failing. So I wouldn't change anything. I'm happy with the way my life turned out. It's fine. I wouldn't change a thing, not I think I'm great, because if I eliminate the failure, I can't eliminate the failure without eliminating what learning comes from the failure. And in life, a lot of our learning doesn't come from the success. A lot of our learning comes from when we fail. Okay. Absolutely. The best uh, learnings are coming from failure, isn't it? Um, we have another question that says, uh, how can leaders bring more structure in their business and leadership? Okay. Well, um, yeah, yeah. well, one I've already mentioned. The first one is that six question coaching process. So, you know, I'm gonna send it to you. You send me an email to remind me, I'll forget. Six question, See, I need structure. I have a very good heart and a bad memory. So if you don't remind me to send you these articles, I'll forget. I need structure. Now, of course, I'm, I'll send it. I'm going to share the structure I use in my own life to help me. I'm going to share this with everyone in the room. Now, I'm going to teach you something now that takes three minutes a day. Three minutes. Costs nothing. And will help you get better at almost anything. Some people are skeptical now. Three minutes a day. Costs nothing help me get better at almost anything, that sounds too good to be true. Half of the people that start doing this quit within two weeks. They quit within two weeks. And they do not quit because it does not work. They quit because it does work. What I'm going to teach you next is a way of structure. It's called the daily question process. This is incredibly easy to understand it is incredibly difficult to do. And by the way, anyone who tells me this is easy to do, you have proven one thing to me, you have never done it. You have never done it. If you've tried this, this is not easy to do, it's hard. I've been doing this for about 30 years. How, how does the process work? Most people cannot make it two weeks. Oh, by the way, I have someone call me every day on the phone. Every day, someone calls me. 
uh, it's been various different people over different times in my life. Now my friend Mark Thompson is calling me. Reem, you've met Mark before. So Mark calls me every day now. Before it was Jasmine who called me every day. Now Mark is calling me. I always have someone and we share ideas with each other every day. So every day someone calls me on the phone. Now a person asked me once, uh, G Marshall, why do you have someone call you on the phone every day just to listen to you read these questions you wrote and provide the answers you wrote every day. Why do you do this? Don't you know the theory about how to change behavior? Don't you know the theory about how to change behavior? I wrote the theory about how to change behavior. That's why I have someone call me. I know how difficult this is. My name is Marshall Goldsmith. I got ranked number one coach in the whole world for many years. I have someone call me on the phone every day just to listen to me, read questions and provide answers every day. Why do I do this? I'm too cowardly to do this by myself. I don't have enough courage. I'm too undisciplined to do this by myself. I need help. I need help and it's okay. We all need help. I need help, you need help. Get over that silly macho nonsense of I can do it on my own. I'd like somebody to write in a, a comment. Uh, somebody that is not a good listener and you have not been a good listener for many decades, right? And name, my name is Dave. I, I'm not a good listener. I need help. Whatever your name would be, write it there in the comments. Let's see if someone wants to send in a good comment about they're not a good listener. Well, while people are pondering, um, let's imagine that you need to be a better listener. Oh, you may, let's imagine you've been needing to be a better listener for 20 years. Why do you think you're going to fix that? Yeah, here's one, Amy. Amy says, I'm not a good listener. Let's pretend, Amy, you haven't been a good listener. Yeah, here's another one. My name is uh, Kwasim. I need to be a better listener. Very good. <laughs> now, let's imagine that your name is Amy. So, Amy, I want you to raise your hand up here for me and say, my name is Amy. I need to be a better listener. I haven't fixed this by myself in decades. Who am I kidding? I'm not gonna fix it by myself in the future. I need help. It's okay. Now, Reem, one thing I'm very proud of in my book, Triggers, 27 major CEOs endorsed that book. 27 big people. Why am I so proud? 30 years ago, no CEO would admit to having a coach. They're ashamed to have a coach. Today, 27 people. Uh, by the way, my name is Alan. I'm CEO of the year in the United States. I need help. It's okay. And my name is Francis Hesselbein. I won the Presidential Medal of Freedom. I need help. It's okay. And my name is Jim Kim. I'm President of World Bank. I need help. It's okay. My name is Mike Duke. I'm CEO of Walmart. I need help. It's okay. Uh, my name is Tony. I'm head of the New York Public Library. I need help. It's okay. We all need help. It's okay. One of the things I've tried to do as a coach is make it okay to need help. Oh, by the way, Reem, not only do our clients need help, guess who else needs help? We need help. We're not better than our clients. We all need help. Now, let me describe the process. Here's how it works. And I, Reem, uh, daily question process, you write me an email, and I'll include this on my list and send it to everybody. So you need to take all these notes down. Every day, okay, here's how it works. You get out a spreadsheet. And on one column, you write down a series of questions that represent what's most important in your life. It could be your friends and your family, your health, the work, coaching, whatever it is for you, you write down these questions, such as regular follow-up with my coaching client, or here's how much I weigh, or here's how many push-ups I did, whatever. Every question has to be answered with a yes, a no, or a number. Yes is recorded as a one. No is recorded as a zero or some number, such as, you know, how many push-ups did I do as a number? Every day, here's the questions, seven boxes for every day of the week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. At the end of the week, you see you get a little report card. 
It will add up the numbers and give you a little score. I'm going to warn all of you in advance. The little report card at the end of the week might not be quite as beautiful as the corporate values plaque that you see stuck up on the wall. When you do this every day, you very quickly learn that life, life is incredibly easy to talk. And life is incredibly difficult to live. When you do this every day, you don't look at those talk values. Those are beautiful. You look at those live values, not usually so pretty, kind of hard to look at. You know, Yareem, you said uh, so many nice comments about me. You left one thing out about me that's so impressive. I'm surprised you left it out. I, the, I have the incredible ability to screw something up every day. Yeah, every day I screw something up. Amazing ability. Every day I always make some mistake. Every day. The hard thing is when you do this process, you get to look at it every day. And it's not always so pretty. I'll share some of my questions. They're not intended to be yours. One of my questions every day is this. How many times yesterday did you try to prove that you were right when it was not worth it? How many times yesterday did you try to prove you were right when it was not worth it? You know, I'm, I don't see too many zeros on my scorecard there. I don't see too many perfect days. Now, my fine engineers who've been listening, uh, my fine engineers, have any of you ever tried to be right when it wasn't worth it once or twice? Yeah, yeah. Uh, how about you coaches? How about this question for the coaches? Uh, how many times today did I try to quote, help someone or coach someone who really had no interest in me coaching them? Yeah. How many coaches have done that? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, trying to coach your husband or wife or your mother. Yeah. Uh, I was teaching my class at Johnson & Johnson. Uh, I, a woman, I said, how many of you are trying to coach your parents that don't want to change? So I said, who are you trying to coach, your mother or father? She said, my father. I said, what's his problem? She says, he does not have a healthy lifestyle. So I asked her, how old is your father? She said, 94 years old. <laughs> <laughs> Leave the old man alone. He's 94 years old. <laughs> Quit bothering him. Let him do whatever he wants. <laughs> well, a good question. How many times did you try to coach somebody that wasn't, didn't want to be coached? And how's that going for you? Uh, another question is, how much do you weigh? How many push-ups? How many sit-ups? How much did you walk? Did I say or do something nice for my wife? Did I say or do something nice for my son, my daughter, my grandchildren? Just questions about life every day. Well, fill this thing out every day and you're gonna get a report card. Here's my prediction. And this is all written in my book, Triggers. My prediction is most of you can't do it by yourself over two weeks. It's very hard. And we make these excuses. Well, I got bored. You didn't get bored. It takes three minutes a day. I didn't have time. Yeah, sure. It takes three minutes a day. You had time. Why didn't we do it? It's very hard to look in the mirror. Now back to that good question about structure. During this period, during this period, we don't need less structure, we need more. Don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed to need help. Don't be ashamed to need structure. There's a great book called The Checklist Manifesto, which is a great example of this. Written by Dr. Atul Gawani from Harvard Medical School. If you go in for a surgery and a nurse asks the doctor a series of questions from a checklist before the surgery, the odds on unneeded infection plummet and the death rate is cut by two thirds. This is not a theory, it's a fact. The huge majority of hospitals around the world do not allow the nurse to ask the doctor the questions. Why? Ego. According to Dr. Gwandi, more people have died because of the egos of surgeons than died in the Vietnam War and the Afghan War and the Iraqi War combined. Ego. Too much ego, too, too much pride. They're ashamed to admit they need help. They're ashamed to admit they need structure. We all need help. I need help, you need help, our clients need help. We all need help. So that's a good example of how you can use structure to help yourself or help other people. Reem, next good yes. question. How can we overcome our ego? 
And that is an ongoing drama. I have trained many, many hundreds of coaches in my life. The biggest problem of all the coaches I've ever trained, including myself, is the ego of the coach. What does that mean? We want people to get better so we can look in the mirror and feel good about ourselves. We want to be able to say, oh, my client got better because of me. Look what I did because of me, me, me. They're all spectacular. They got so much better because of me. I helped them so much. Me, 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 me. My greatest lesson in my coaching, I don't get paid if my clients don't get better. Better is not judged by me or them. It's judged by everyone around them. Very humbling. The client I spent the least amount of time with improved the most. The client I spent the most amount of time with did not improve at all and didn't get paid. What did I learn? It's not about me. For those of you with a background in mathematics, I made a, a checklist. On one dimension, it was called time spent with the coach Marshall Goldsmith. The other dimension called improvement. There was a clear negative correlation between spending time with me and getting better. I thought, well, that's a troubling checklist or a troubling chart. So I go to my friend, Alan, who improved the most, who I spent the least amount of time with. I said, Alan, my friend, I show this chart. I said, Alan, of all the people I've coached, uh, I spent the least amount of time coaching you and you improved the most and you were great to start with. And the way this chart looks, like the more time people spend with me, the worse off they are. The way this chart looks, Alan, if you never met me, you'd really be good. So I asked my friend, Alan, what should I learn about coaching from you? He taught me two great lessons. This will help you get over your ego. He said, lesson number one, your biggest challenge as a coach is customer selection. If you pick great customers, your coaching process will always work. If you pick the wrong customer, your coaching process will never work. He said, number two, never let the coaching process be about yourself and your own ego and how smart you think you are. Make it about the great people that you work with and how proud you are of them. Don't make it about yourself. Make it about you, the great people you work with. And, and he said, when I was a CEO, my job wasn't that different. He said, I don't design the cars or build the cars. I have to have good people. And two, I always told myself, leadership's not about me. It's about them. When I coach people, the first thing I say now is, I do not get paid if you don't get better. Better is not judged by me or you. It's judged by everyone else. I do not get paid because I'm a good coach. I get paid because you're a great client. Don't make it about me. It's not about me, it's about you. Well, at the end of the day, for a great coach, it's not about you, it's about them. You wanna get over your own ego, start realizing it's not all about you. If you don't have great clients, you're just wasting your time. It's all about them. It's all about them. That's a good way to reduce that uh, ego problem. Yeah. Someone had a question here about, can we change the daily question process? Change it any time you want to. How frequently you should do it every day? Every day, why do I do it every day? The reason I do it every day is pretty simple. I can't remember what I did two days ago or three days ago. Don't kid yourself. You know, if you don't do it every day, it probably won't happen. You know, you just need to keep it on your mind day after day, after day, after day, after day, after day, after day. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we have, um, we have, uh, Taimur is asking, as a leader, one challenge is to manage expectations of all the stakeholders. What yes. are some ways to manage that? Well, again, my whole coaching process is called stakeholder-centered coaching. So what I suggest is first, you get into a habit of asking a question. The questions we as leaders seldom ask, or as humans seldom ask, what can I do to be a better? How can I be a better coach? How can I be a better manager? How can I be a better peer, peer team member? How can I be a better father? How can I be a better mother, a better son, a better daughter? Get in the habit of asking these questions and then listen to people and follow up. Now, let me ask the group a question. I'd like people to type in the answers here. Reem, you can read some of the answers to me. And then sure. the first question is, do you believe that customer satisfaction is important? Yes or no? Just write down yes or no and send in those nice answers. Customer satisfaction. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. A lot of yeses. 
Very good. I'm going to ask. Except uh, for one no. That's okay. We only no. have one no, yeah. Don't worry about the no. Almost all yeses. And do you agree that it's good to ask your customers for their ideas? That's a good idea. Ask the customers for their ideas. Yes, of course. There's of course. There's a yes. Right, Always. My, now, reading this next one is only for people that are married, okay? Now, I want you to tell the truth out there. Have you been asking your husband or wife, uh, what can I do to be a better partner in our relationship? What's the answer to that question? No. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> few yeses, lots of no's. <laughs> a few yeses, but uh, no, not so good anymore. No, no, not so much. No. <laughs> Duh, that is good. <laughs> well, you see, it's, uh, who's more important, those customers or the person you live with? Well, generally the person we live with is the most important, but we often don't ask them, how can I be a better husband? What can I do to be a better wife? Or ask your children, what can I do to be a better mother? What can I do to be a better father? When I, was, um, when I was younger, I asked my children a question. My daughter was 11 years old and my son was nine years old. And I asked them a question. Um, what can I do to be a better father? And the problem in asking the question is you get the answer. My daughter said, daddy, you travel a lot. That is not what bothers me. What bothers me is the way you act when you come home. You talk on the phone, you watch the sports, you don't spend much time with me. And she said, one time it was Saturday and I wanted to go to a party at my friend's house and mommy did not let me go. I had to stay home with you, but then you spent no time with me. That was not right. What could I say? Thank you, daddy must do better. I said, I'm gonna keep track of how many days I can spend four hours with my family, four hours. No TV, no movies, just with the family, four hours. 1991, 92 days. 1992, 110 days. 1993, 131 days. 1994, 135 days. I made more money the year I spent 135 days, four hours with my family, than the year I spent 20 days. What did I learn? The San Diego Chargers American football team don't care about me. It took me a while to figure that one out. Now it's January 1, 1995. They're both teenagers, daddy's proud. I have my charts. I said, kids, look, 135 days far as with daddy. What goal this year? How about 150 days? They both go, no, no, daddy, no, no, too much, too much. You've overachieved, overachieved. My son said 50 is a good goal. I learned a very good lesson. When your children are little, it is good to do this. Why? They need us. They need us. When they get older, it becomes very important for a very different reason. What is it? We need them. We need them. So it's good to do this. Good to do this at work, even more at home. I was teaching a class for a company called the Kaiser Permanente Company, a very large hospital company. And a woman named Trudy raised her hand and she said, I've been to your course twice. I've read everything you've ever written. There's always something you've left out. She said, please ask people to do this with their parents. Please ask people to do this with their parents. She said, I went to your class and my daughter was 17 years old. And I asked my daughter, what can I do to be? What can I do to be a better mother? And then she said, we had a nice talk. My daughter said, what can I do to be a better daughter? She thought, well, that was so nice, I should call my mother. She said, I call my mother and I asked my mother, what can I do to be a better daughter? And she said, my mother said, your father's dead. I live alone in the country. Every day I take a long walk up the road to go to my mailbox to get the mail. And almost every day there's nothing in the mail. Every day that makes me very sad. She said, as your mother, it would mean so much to me if you would send me a little picture, a card or something. So when I walked to the mailbox, I would find something was in my mailbox. 
she started sending her mother little pictures and cards every day. What did that cost her? Nothing. What did that mean to her mother? Everything. She sent me an email about three years later and the email said, my mother just died. The last thing her mother told her before she died was, thank you for doing that. Thank you. If your parents are still alive, this is very good to do for three reasons. Number one, it is very good for them. Even if they say you have nothing to improve, they'll be very proud that you cared enough to ask. Number two, it's good for you. What is the number one regret children have when mom and dad die? Why didn't I thank them for the many nice things they did to help me? Why was I always judging them? And number three, if you have children, this is very good for your little children. Why is it good for your little children? You know the old people that you're calling up on the telephone? Guess what? You are going to be the old person. Do you want your little child calling you up on a telephone? Your little child is not going to listen to what you say. Your little child is going to watch what you do. Our values are not what we say. Our values are what we do. I'd like to ask people who are writing in the chat box to answer one question. Who is one person that you should be asking this question? How can I be better? That really is important in your life. Who is one person that you should ask this question to? One person says, my dad, my mom, myself, my mother, my father, my kids, my mom, my wife, my son, many people, my husband, my dog. <laughs> I like that one, my dog. <laughs> I love dogs. <laughs> oh, that was funny. All the people around me. So I've got a variety of different answers to that question. You know, the question is, how can I be a better? How can I be a better? Now, here's the important point. Whoever that is for you, do that. Nobody can answer that question for you but you. Nobody can answer that question for you but you. The answer is, though, whoever that is for you, do that. Okay. Reem. Yes. Um, we have a question from uh, Dimitris. Uh, I hope I pronounced your name correctly, from Athens. And he's saying, Dr. Marshall would love to listen your thoughts about the magic blend <laughs> of vulnerability and humility when leading or coaching. Well, you see, I think every leader I coach, every leader that I, we'll start with the leader and then the coach. Every leader I coach has to ask this question, how can I be better? <clears throat> every leader gets confidential feedback and then every leader has to apologize. They have to say, you know, I, I need to be, for example, a better listener. I'm sorry if I haven't listened to you well in the past, there's no excuse. Everyone apologizes. We all make mistakes. We all make mistakes. And we all need to apologize. So, Humility is one of the most important factors for a leader. And as a coach, I think, again, humility is realizing that it's not about you. It's about those great people that you work with. It's not about you. It's about them. And your success or failure is much more, is much more about them than it is about you. And it's easy to understand. It's very hard to do. I mean, I get lost in my own ego, just like everyone else does. And it's very, very hard for us not to get so involved in this egotistical stuff that we just forget. We forget it's not really about us. And the thing particular for coaches is it's not your life. It's their life. And it's not, it's their life. And you've got to sit there and say, all right, this is your life. Is this a commitment you want to make? And if they do, that's wonderful. And if they don't, well, you know, it's still their life. It's not your life. All of this, by the way, is very easy in theory. It's very difficult in practice. 
as I said, we have years of experience of taking test after test after test after test after test with one goal, prove you're smart. Prove you're worthy, prove you're smart over and over and over and over and over again. This is so deeply ingrained in us that it's very difficult to stop. If we're not careful, we just go through life playing this out over and over. Let me prove how smart I am. Let me pass the test. You know, Reem, when we get high scores on that test, what do people say? Oh, congratulations. Oh, you're good. How about those low scores? Bad, very bad, very bad. So what are we conditioned to do? Well, let's just prove how smart we are over and over and over again. So, I mean, everything I've been talking about tonight is... Uh, is very, very, again, easy to understand. It's very difficult to do. Things are very deep. They're very deeply ingrained in us. And, you know, let me also talk about the questions. I forgot to say something on that. Is let me give you my first six questions to ask and my daily question process. And I highly recommend these to everybody. Six questions. And they all begin with a phrase. And the phrase is, did I do my best to? Now, it doesn't even mean you succeeded. Did I do my best to, and then rank yourself on a one to 10 scale. One is low and 10 is high. Did I do my best? Now, first, I'm going to share the hardest question you can ever ask yourself every day. It has four qualities. Number one, you write the question. Why is it hard? You can't blame the idiot that wrote the question. You wrote the question. Number two, you know the right answer. Why is that hard? You can't say you don't know how to do it. Number three, you know it's important. It's not trivial. And number four, all you have to do to make a high score is just try. You don't even have to succeed. Did I even try? Now, why would that question be a hard question every day? There's no one to blame. And pretty much every day I fail at least a few questions where I wrote the questions and I know they were important and I didn't even try. Whose fault was that? If I really wanted to look for my problems in life, I found that about 99% of the time, I don't really have to look real far to find out where my problems are. Where are the huge majority of my problems coming from? The guy looking at me in the mirror. Where are most of our problems? They're not out there. Now, I'm going to repeat the six questions that I would ask yourself every day. Okay, ready? Number one. First question, did I do my best to set clear goals? Did I set clear goals for today? Because it's hard to say, did I achieve my goals? Did I even set clear goals for today? Number two, did I do my best to make progress toward achieving my own goals? No. Did I do my best to try to achieve these goals? Number three, did I do my best to find meaning? Rather than waiting for the rest of the world to make my life meaningful, did I do my best to create meaning in my own life? Number four, and we're going to spend some time on this one. Did I do my best to be happy? Did I do my best today to be happy? Now, in my book, Triggers, I talk about four medical, three medical doctors, and I have the rights to use their names, and they're three of the smartest people I ever met. One is my friend, Dr. Jim Kim. Dr. Jim Kim was president of the World Bank, president of Dartmouth College. He has a simultaneous medical degree and PhD from anthropology from Harvard in five years. To put this in context, a normal human being takes eight years to get a PhD in anthropology from Harvard. He got a PhD in anthropology in five years with honors and got a medical degree at the same time. So when the brains were passed out, my friend, Dr. Jim was not in the back of the line. Another one was Dr. Raj Shah, head of the United States Agency for International Development at age 37. He's now the head of the Rockefeller Foundation, the president of the foundation. And the third is Dr. John Noseworthy, who's head of the Mayo Clinic, number one hospital in America. All three, very smart. All three, I ask the same question. On a one to 10 scale, 10 is one, I mean, 10 is high, one is low. What score would you give yourself on the answer to this question? Did I do my best today to be happy? 
did I do my this today to be happy? All three had the same answer. Independently, they had the same answer, exactly the same answer. It never occurred to me to try to be happy. It never occurred to me to try to be happy. And these are all medical doctors. I asked them, did it occur to you that you're going to die? They said, yeah, they learned that in medical school. I said, do you think this is a silly or trivial question? They said, no, it's a very good question. I forgot to ask. I just forgot to ask. So the first three questions, the first four questions. Number one, did I do my best to set clear goals? Number two, did I do my best to make progress toward achieving my goals? Number three, did I do my best to find meaning? Number four, did I do my best to be happy? Those are the first four. Now I'm going to ask everybody, if you don't mind, to answer this question. If you don't want to answer it, you don't have to, but on a one to 10 scale, 10 is high and one is low. What score would you give yourself on the answer to this? On an average day, what score would I give myself on the answer to, did I do my best to be happy? 10 is high, one is low. What score would you get? We're having three, one, zero, one, one, eight, four, wow, seven, four, two. Average answer, I'd say the average answer I know in the world, the average answer in the world is about a five, five. The average answer looks like about a five from this group. Now, the average answer in the world is about a 5.5. Now, remember when you were in school and you took a test and you got a 5.5 out of 10? Would you be proud of that score? No, you would be ashamed of that score. The little test I gave you is about 100 times more important than any test you ever took in school. It's a test about your life. Did I do my best today to be happy? I'm gonna give you one suggestion, raise the score. Raise that score. That's one thing you can control, raise the score. Question number six, did I do my, no, question number five, did I do my best to build positive relationships with people? Did I do my best to build positive relationships with people? And then finally, question number six, did I do my best to be fully engaged in what I was doing? Was I fully engaged in what I was doing every day? Six questions. Well, our research on this is amazing, and Reem, I'll send you the article. And we've asked thousands of people these questions, and just by asking the questions every day, we ask people, how's your life changing? Um, 30, I think 34% of the people two weeks later feel like I got better at everything. 67% said I got better on four of the items. 91% said I got better at one, and 9% said nothing changed, and almost nobody got worse. Why? Every day, these six questions get you to answer the one question that you have total responsibility over. Did I do my best? Every day, did, did you do your best? And finally, I notice our time is right about up. Let me make a final comment. First, I'd like to say, Reem, thank you so much for inviting me to be here. I'd like to thank Thank everyone for please uh, listening to me. Thank everyone for listening. And again, I hope that tonight I've given you something that maybe you can take home and you have just a, a little bit better life. And maybe as a coach, you can help others do that. And I feel very honored to be able to work with people like coaches. Why? Because if I help you even just a little bit, then maybe you can help other people too. And then that spreads to other people. So finally, thank you very much. Dr. Marshall, thank you so much. Uh, we just have spent one hour and a half with, in pure wisdom and with pure wisdom. And I've, it have added a lot to me. Uh, certainly, if it have helped me so much, and I believe that a lot of people here with us have helped them as well. Um, many takeaways from this amazing, amazing one hour and a half. Um, just a short time, but it's, it's worth a lot uh, of, many uh, courses, I would say, combined in, in just one hour and a half. Thank you so much. And I just want to remind everyone that a poll will be uh, up now. It will take you one minute to answer it. It's just to have your quick feedback, uh, which is very important to us. And we highly appreciate it. 
Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Marshall. Uh, highly appreciate you. Sincerely grateful. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Thank you so Bye. much. Thank you. Thank you everyone for attending today. Highly appreciate. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. I, it was amazing for me. And I'm positive from all your comments, mashallah, you guys have really enjoyed it as well. Alhamdulillah. To many more, inshallah. Thank you so much. We highly uh, appreciate and grateful for your attendance. Inside.